there is something in this country, uh, love it or not, that we, we like to see powerful people, particularly people who are perceived as arrogant or above us, fall on their faces. Waterworld. Ishtar. Cop Rock. The Cape Man. These are like these iconic flops. Maybe we need to have them. Maybe they've got some sort of talismanic power. You don't want this to be another Ishtar. And everybody backs off and says, oh my god, we can't have that happen. You can learn a lot from studying a flop. While the show may be lousy, the story of the show and why it flopped is always compelling and dramatic and interesting and worth telling. That's why we're studying the biggest flops in showbiz history in a class called Flops 101, Lessons from the Biz. Welcome to Flops 101. A flop is defined by expectations. That there's a big star, there's, there's a big producer attached, and, and then it just goes no, nowhere. Now class, only a few showbiz failures or flops. One word reminders of epic disaster. Our Christmas play, for example, was not a flop because we didn't have a big star, a big budget, or lots of hype. The traditional recipe for a huge flop includes star power, star ego, ignorance, greed. Mix that up and add 400 tons of hubris. Does anyone know what hubris means? Arrogance. And most people don't forget arrogant kinds of flops. We remember the failures that fell from the greatest heights, that had the greatest ambitions, the greatest potential, had the most money spent on them. Um, you know, failing big means failing memorably. Nobody sets out to produce a bad show. Everyone who believed that they were doing a really good show that I think they fundamentally believed in had artistic merit and commercial possibilities. And for a variety of reasons, it just went off track. Now write these down, students. Reason number one that showbiz projects flop too much ego. Waterworld is just a total vanity project by a big star who decides he can, you know, do any folly he wants and feel that the public will like it no matter how silly it is. Reason number two, press and hype are unmanageable. It was so often called the $50 million Ishtar. At that time, that was, you know, breaking the bank. But I remember it as something that got a bad rap because of the price tag almost becoming part of the title. And reason number three for flops, it's just a bad idea. I've made the joke that there, were three, there seem to be three iron laws in history uh, based on what happened at, uh, at Cop Rock. One uh, is you should never fight a land war in Asia. Uh, two, you should never march on Moscow. And thirdly, you should never let cops sing. And there are aspects of that that uh, redound with common sense. You can learn a lot from studying a hit and a flop. That kind of um, passion and that kind of drive is what's going to take you to the top and also may drive you to the bottom. Coming up next period in Flops 101, lessons from the silver screen. Ishtar does carry with it a certain connotation of, of failure, and, and maybe because it's a word that really doesn't mean anything. Because it's, it's a word that's open to definition, I think over time it took on failure.
Okay, quiet down, class. Our first lesson in flops comes from Hollywood. The potential for failure, I think, is magnified in Hollywood because Hollywood, it's all under the microscope of the media, more so than any other industry, because Hollywood is sexy, is interesting, sells magazines. The Hollywood historical landscape is sort of littered with flops. Cleopatra, there had been so much advanced publicity about the romance between Taylor and Burton, and the film was just stultifyingly boring. Dr. Doolittle, a star with Julie Andrews, Torah, 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 a World War II movie partially made by the Japanese. It basically sunk that studio for a while. So a really terrific movie flop is one that not only dies itself, but kills whole careers, studios, executives in its way. And of course, one of the most famous is Heaven's Gate, a movie so bad that it killed United Artists. And then there's Geely. That's a recent flop you kids have probably even heard of. The J-Lo Affleck uh, playing out of Geely is just another version of Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton bombing in Cleopatra decades earlier. Heaven's Gate, Waterworld, Ishtar, those are like sort of the three big ones that people talk about. Ishtar has a sort of continued resonance in Hollywood because it is an example for studios of how you can have what seems like all the right elements and you still can have the thing go off the rails. Ishtar was sort of a road comedy and sort of in the spirit of Bing Crosby and Bob Hope about these two guys, Warren Beatty and Dustin Hoffman, who are these failed singers. I like the idea of two performers that are so inept that they can't even get booked in America and go to some other place called Ishtar and then they suddenly get caught up in some kind of uh, foreign spy intrigue. Rather than shoot Ishtar in the deserts of Southern California, director Elaine May decided to film in Morocco. Now class, Morocco is very, very far from Hollywood. You usually go on location for huge, epic movies. For a comedy, it's rare. We kept thinking, why, why didn't they just go into the Mojave Desert? I think they went to Morocco because they had two major stars and a director who wanted to go. And so no one told them no. They just let them kind of do whatever they wanted. Ishtar started production in 1985 with, write this down, a $28 million budget. That was a very expensive comedy back then. I hoped for the best. But as Mel Brooks says, hope for the best, expect the worst. That's what happened. What began to happen in Morocco was that you also had three perfectionist, detail-oriented people all used to being in control. And you had in Elaine May, reportedly, all kinds of perfectionist issues. So you, you started to hear stories about her reshaping sand dunes to get the right shape. Elaine had trouble dealing with the desert. What happens in a series of dunes is you lose somebody the minute they go over a hill. So we scraped out about a mile square of dunes with caterpillar bulldozers. Uh, you could have done it at Brighton Beach. The media really got onto Ishtar early, and, it, and a part of that was just because of, the, of all the huge profile people. They felt that they were running off and just being, uh, going over the top, spending lots of money, and then coming up with something that was just sort of a simple film. That's the hook. That's a good story. It was so often called the $50 million Ishtar. It was a New York Magazine story um, that really threw everything into a tailspin, and that, that were these stories from Morocco about reshaping sand dunes. And after a while, it doesn't even matter whether it's true or not. The fact that it was written makes it true, and so everybody is repeating the rumors over and over and over again. Now, write this down. When Ishtar finished shooting, the producer spent 10 months editing the film. That's about twice as long as usual. There were reports 
And again, it doesn't even matter if these are true anymore. They've just become legend that they had three teams of editors that both Hoffman and Beatty and Elaine May all had sort of their cut of the film that they were working on. It did go on for much longer than most movies do. They had two, you know, wonderful actors who did a lot of improvising. They had a director who could rewrite on a moment's notice, and they, they just came up with lots of, lots of material. When Ishtar finally opened in May 1987, the reviews called it a runaway ego trip and compared it to the worst flops in Hollywood history. I think because it was such a big production, going to an exotic location, I think maybe the press expected uh, a Lawrence of Arabia. When it's people involved who are at the top of their form, if they turn out something that wasn't what you felt they should turn out, then, uh, then that's no good, then they failed. Ishtar ended up costing more than $50 million, but it made only $4 million in its opening weekend. Now, kids, what's $50 million minus $4 million? Ishtar does carry with it a certain connotation of failure because it's a word that really doesn't mean anything. It was a fictitious country in the Middle East. So I think because it's, it's a word that's open to definition, I think over time, it took on failure. Class, there are a lot of lessons to write down from this case study. The lessons on Ishtar are make sure that you have a director who's in charge of a film, not a star. One of the rules of production design is, if you know what you're doing, find it as near as you can to a city and as close to a road as possible. I think it taught the industry how buzz and rumor and gossip can be just as toxic as truth. Ishtar becomes sort of a life lesson in Hollywood. The reason is because it seemed everything was in place for that movie to succeed, and it failed. This was my very first script. There was some intangible energy in, in the script. I mean, when people were reading it, the first thing they thought was brand new world. Essentially, Mad Max on water that hadn't been done before. It's a phenomenal story that they're trying to tell. I mean, think of another movie that's like Waterworld. There just isn't anything like that. This was a script with so much stuff in it that the stuff had to all be filmed. There's a wall of flames. There's a plane landing on top of the tanker. There's an underwater city. There's three sharks. Love working with sharks. If you want exciting stuff, it takes time and it takes money to do it. Most of Waterworld would take place on the sea or an enormous floating city called the Atoll. An Atoll is a small island made of coral. But Hollywood is a world of make-believe, so Waterworld's atoll was built with wood and steel. There was a lot of discussion as to where the best place to shoot was. There's three water tanks in the world where you can shoot on water in a controlled situation. Steven Spielberg personally called Kevin Reynolds, who he had a relationship with, and said, Buddy, you know, whatever you do, don't shoot this on water. I mean, I mean, what you have to shoot on water, shoot on water, you know, shoot 20% on water, but, you know, do blue screen, get a tank, do anything, you know. Water will kill you. And they chose to ignore that advice. I have no idea why. It wasn't tank work. The atoll was, think of where we are, it was the size of this block. That's not tank work. Well, we decided to go to Hawaii. We were on the Kona coast of the Big Island. In March of 1994, Waterworld began production with Kevin Costner in the lead in an approved budget of $99.7 million. Now, class, repeat that for me, $99.7 million. The story that one most often heard going around Kauai Hai Harbor and going around the Kona coast of the Big Island of Hawaii was one of arrogance. First of all, in Hawaii, the word Kauai Hai means water of wrath, which is hysterical, but apparently nobody thought to ask, you know, Kauai Hai, that's a kind of a cute name, what does it mean? Uh, you know, the weather was so unpredictable there, the wind was so bad there, that shooting there was just an impossibility. Every day became sort of a shooting nightmare. Even though the call time was 6 a.m., um, by the time you got the picture boat, the camera boat, the catering boat, the bathroom boat, the snacks boat, the wardrobe boat, the so-and-so boat, all 
together in a flotilla, and then they traveled the requisite 15 miles or whatever to get 360 degrees of ocean, you're talking noon. So your first shot is at noon with an overhead sun. There was a lot of tension on the set, as you can imagine. I think tensions were heavy between the director and Kevin Costner. Every day they would look at rushes, they would look at dailies, and they would realize this isn't really working out. By the time the movie was over, they were not on speaking terms, and I don't know if they've, they've spoken since. Waterworld fell more than a month behind schedule, and the budget rose over $125 million. Now, class, what was its original budget? $100 million. There were many stories emanating from the set. For some reason, the press felt a lot of people would be interested in, in problems on the most expensive picture ever made. I don't know who the snitch was. I still wish I did know who the snitch was. I could rip his heart out. When Waterworld got into trouble, what everyone said right away was, oh, it's really out of control. It's fish tar, you know, it's Kevin's gate. Waterworld ended up costing more than $175 million, and it took 155 days to shoot. That's almost as many days as we're in school each year. The night of the premiere was extremely exciting. Notwithstanding everything that had happened, and now, you know, you're about to open the, the, the Pandora's box of, you know, whether or not the film is going to sink or swim. Waterworld earned less than $22 million during its first week in theaters. Now, class, what's $175 million minus $22 million? The perception, I believe, at least outside of Hollywood, is that, that it was a flop because of how expensive it was. But the truth is, it it grossed $325 million worldwide, which is a very significant number. So class, what lessons can we learn from the Waterworld case study? It's a question of perception. What people remember is the pre-release publicity, the budget that was out of control. People will tell you, this is one of the biggest movie losers of all time. In fact, at the bottom line, that's not true at all. Over time, it earned a fair amount of money. It's not nearly the gigantic flop that people perceive it to be. I learned that you need to make sure that you have good relationships with the media and that they understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. They start circling like sharks, and as soon as the water gets bloody, I mean, they're all coming in there for a bite of it. The other lesson in Hollywood is, if you've got a movie that's out of control, if you've got a movie that's running away from you, it doesn't matter how much money you spend chasing it, it's not going to come back. I lost my innocence having gone through the water roll experience, um, which, is a, which is a really tough thing. Coming up next period, lessons in flopping from the small screen. The whole thing kind of peaked on the night that it aired nationally. They actually aired the show in Times Square on the Jumbotron. And it was fantastic. The next day, I think we got some terrible rating, you know. And it was like, bang, you crashed the next day. One thing about television is that you can fail more spectacularly and yet have millions of people watch what you've done. You could put on a show that was watched by 10 million people and be a colossal failure. Class, promising shows with huge stars have flopped since the beginning of television. The famous one was uh, the game show that Jackie Gleason produced, uh, which he put on and he, they did one episode and it did abysmally. And he came back the next week and he said, we put on a show that laid one of the biggest bombs in the history of television. And it was, 
actually a pretty remarkable moment. One of the biggest flops I've ever been television was the very first episode of 2020, which involved two sort of legendary people in journalism as hosts, the art critic Robert Hughes, then from Time Magazine, and Harold Hayes, who was a famous editor of Esquire Magazine. And the first episode of it was such a disaster that they were both canned after one night and the whole show was redone with Hugh Downs and then Barbara Walters and became a completely different show. Now, kids, I saw some big flops on late night TV when I used to stay up after midnight grading papers including The Late Show with Joan Rivers and The Chevy Chase Show. The Chevy Chase Show came with a fair amount of buildup. It not only didn't do well, but it was so atrociously bad. And then it was gone within, I think it was within six weeks. That's, that's another, I think, kind of legendary flop. Failure is the rule rather than the exception in television. The TV business is sort of like the restaurant business, you know. 80, 90 percent of, of new enterprises end up failing and, and failing pretty quickly. Now take out your notebooks for our television case studies. The first is from writer-producer Stephen Bochco. Bochco had come off L.A. Law, Dunhill Street Blues. They made a deal with Bochco in the late 80s to give them 10 series over an extended number of years at something like a commitment of $50 million. He had a chance to finally do something that he'd always wanted to play around with or do because he was in a position of power enough uh, that he could at least get it up for the audience to see. Stephen took a tremendous chance and said, well, let's have cops sing. Let's do something that no one sees coming. Uh, let's do a musical. It was an entirely new concept. It was a completely new way of doing television. The actors who were auditioning, we all just knew no matter what, it was going to be groundbreaking. Cop Rock began production in the summer of 1990. Its budget was $2 million an episode. That's about twice the normal price for a one-hour drama, and more than most teachers will earn in their entire careers. Stephen didn't want to do it like a half-hour sitcom. He, he really wanted it to have serious content as well as music and dance. All the rules were being rewritten. It wasn't making a music video. It wasn't making a movie musical. It was elevating emotion through music. The ending of the pilot, to me, um, in my most objective eye, is one of the best moments in TV ever, where Kathleen Wilhoyt sings a lullaby to her baby. A middle-class couple comes, exchanges money for the baby, drives away with it, and she continues to sing a lullaby. You can't do any better than that. That's great. That's great television. Cop Rock was screened in its entirety at the ABC affiliates meeting in Los Angeles. And they usually don't do that at affiliates meetings. They usually will show clips of the new shows. I remember them showing the very last scene that I spoke about of Kathleen Wilhoyt singing that lullaby. And when it was done, you could hear a pin drop. And this, this, this guy from the affiliate just leaned over and said, oh, hell, she wouldn't sing when she sells her baby. <laughs> I went, we're dead. We're dead. Oh, my god, we're dead. When Cop Rock premiered, only about 19% of viewers tuned in to the show. Class, that just wasn't enough viewers for a network television show back then. There were rumors almost immediately that ABC wanted him to take the songs out of it uh, and just do it as a straight cop show. And Bochco rejected that. No changes. He stayed true to his vision and right through to the end. There really wasn't anything you could do to make those ratings better. This was what that show was. And um, it's not like you could throw out a character and put another one in or anything like that, because that wasn't why they weren't watching it. They weren't watching it because it wasn't enjoyable. In November 1990, ABC took Cop Rock off the air after only 11 episodes. This is a very important vocabulary word, canceled. I don't think there was an easy blend between 
the acting and the stories and then going into the music. It, it wasn't organic yet. You were not led into a fantasy. You had to sit there and decide, is this going on in their mind? You had to figure out why this was happening, when it was happening. People didn't want to do that. I think a really noble experiment that was probably preordained to fail. This was a moment in time. This was a moment, and it was not allowed to go on, but that's okay because the moment is complete, you know? And now, class, what lessons can we learn from our Cop Rock case study? Every producer of a hit show has a failure in them struggling to get out. When a producer has a big hit, they get the freedom to make exactly the show they want to make. It doesn't have the kind of commercial appeal that a network needs to make it a hit. The normal viewing audience is not willing to be challenged, you know, when they're watching television. They sit down, they want to be entertained, um, and they don't want to have to make decisions or choices. I would be terrified that, that people would learn from that not to take chances. And I think that in time, we would have learned the necessary lessons and made it, made it work in the long term. My development executives and I sat down and we kind of had a hit list. And we said, OK, who are the people we want to be in business with? And on top of that hit list was Darren Starr. Darren had been credited with the success of Beverly Hills 90210 and then Melrose Place. And he was the hot property in terms of writer-producers at that time. It was really kind of a, a seminal moment for CBS in the 1990s because CBS had an older audience watching the network. They desperately wanted to get a younger audience. And their quick fix response was, let's do our own Melrose Place. Central Park West wasn't just a new show for CBS. It offered the network a chance to assume an entirely new and younger identity. They had very high expectations for it. In fact, once they saw the final script for the pilot, I think we even got a pickup for the whole series at that point. So we knew we were going to, our chances of going on the air were very, very high. We got great responses from the material and the acting community. There weren't very, very many people that we uh, asked to read who didn't or who we made offers to who didn't accept them. There was a tremendous amount of attention paid to the show. Now here's a date to write down. Central Park West premiered on September 13th, 1995, with Mariel Hemingway leading the ensemble cast. They actually aired the show in Times Square on the Jumbotron. And Darren and I and some of the cast went down there and watched it on the Jumbotron. It was fantastic. It was like the peak of the whole experience. Because the next day, I think we got some terrible rating, you know. And it was like, bang, you crashed the next day. The CBS executives, you know, picked up the ratings and saw a single digit share next to the show. And there was, you know, just, just this tremendous sense of depression came over everybody. Oh, it was like a disaster. It was crushing. Central Park West was actually a really interesting example of putting a show on the wrong network with the expectation that this genre is working somewhere else. The rollout strategy was fatally flawed. They rolled it out against the first broadcasts of Beverly Hills 90210 and Melrose Place both of which were two-hour season premieres of big stories that had been left hanging at the end of the prior season. What do you think the chances were that they were going to switch over? After nine low-rated episodes, CBS pulled Central Park West off the schedule and tried to fix it. Class, that's called a hiatus. Very few programs succeed after a hiatus. They started changing the cast. CBS wanted to get rid of Mario Hemingway, which is what happened. They brought in a couple new cast members, ultimately Raquel Welch. By then, I was, I was out of there. You know, I didn't really want to do a show with Raquel Welch. Many failing television shows bring in big stars to try to improve ratings. 
But Raquel Welsh, an actress famous for starring in a movie called One Million Years B.C., didn't help CPW. That was kind of an act of, of desperation. They spent millions promoting the show. There was such a buildup to it that I think there was some reluctance to just throw it all away. The end came for Central Park West on June 28, 1996. CBS canceled it after 17 episodes. That's kind of the classic example of a flop because it was a very high profile concept. It had a big cast. Uh, it was set in New York. The, the New York media covered it very extensively. And then it landed and just flatter than a piece of paper. I thought it was going to be a huge success, you know. But you know, Self-delusion is all part of Hollywood. <laughs> you know, there's no, you know, that's part of what we do. We believe in it so totally that you, you're sure it's going to succeed, you know? And then years later, you look back on it and go, well, what was I thinking? What lessons can be drawn from this case study? Lesson one was you can't just turn the lights out, pull the shade down on the audience you have and expect a new audience to show up. We had a gorgeous cast. And I think what happened was that ultimately, inside this beautiful, wrought urn, there wasn't enough substance. When you make a big, 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 big splash, you really have to control expectations about what it's going to be coming out of the gate. And once people think that, you know what, it's a failure, trying to correct that perception is really difficult, because you're talking about an ethereal, kind of intangible product. Coming up next period, lessons from Broadway's biggest flops. The dark side of human nature is such that we do like to see people fail. I mean, you really sometimes cannot succeed unless your uh, rivals fail. There's a hierarchy of failure. The theater is most interesting in its failures simply because it's live. You are trapped in the room with these people, and they're stuck there too. They have to perform it on stage, even for a very short run. And they know what they're doing. They're not stupid. And so you're sort of locked in this kind of madness. Class, on Broadway, it's very easy to flop. Every production is big and expensive. Only one theater full of customers can pay to see it at a time, so it takes a long time for producers to make money, and almost every show lives or dies on its reviews. The press in this business, unlike the movies or television, we have an enormous amount of power over the fate of those shows, and that power is concentrated in a handful of us. The Times has the ultimate power in, in its critic, Ben Brantley, to really sort of kill with one slash in the review. That's true, kids. Some Broadway productions close the day after they open because the reviews are so bad. And where do these shows end up? Here at Joe Allen in New York City. For a poster to hang on this restaurant's walls, it must be a flop. As you can see, Broadway has had a lot of flops over the years. Look, class, there's A Doll's Life, and Breakfast at Tiffany's, and Nick and Nora. The flop that everyone on Broadway likes is the real sort of campy, hootie flop. Carrie is the classic one. Carrie, a musical version of Stephen King with songwriters you've never heard of, you know, opening the show with a song about uh, uh, the girls in the locker room having their period. Legs Diamond, the Peter Allen musical. I mean, this in itself, talk about camp. I mean, here you have one of the swishiest entertainers in the history of showbiz playing a New York City virile gangster. Moose Murders, that was a murder mystery set in an Adirondack hunting lodge where it turned out the quadriplegic character was the murderer. That literally closed in one night. Broadway loves disasters. You know, this is a world full of petty, envious people, and they love to see their colleagues fail. And when they fail in a spectacular way, they derive a great deal of pleasure out of it.
The Cape Man was an original Broadway musical by Paul Simon, a recording artist who has sold even more records and CDs than Britney Spears. So people expected his musical to be great. I was very excited about Paul Simon doing something for the theater. I think he's one of our great poets and songwriters. Paul himself had never done musical theater, so it was a new experience for him, and we were kind of just riding on his coattails. I remember hearing about his interview in Vogue magazine, where he said he hadn't really liked a musical in 20 years or something like that. And I remember thinking at the time, I don't think that was a good idea, Paul. <laughs> you know? You're kind of asking to be let into a club saying you don't want to be a member. Now students, even though Paul Simon was new to the Broadway club, he hired other inexperienced people to produce and direct The Cape Man, and then began rehearsing in the summer of 1997. It was very flat, it was very muted, it was very boring, it had no theatrical muscularity to it, and it was poorly directed. There was nobody in there to knock the heads around, and uh, in the end it was Paul Sh Simon calling the shots. Paul Simon finally fired the director and hired one of Broadway's best, Jerry Zachs. But Jerry and Paul argued about how the musical should look and sound. A really extraordinary and something... Paul that... Simon is a real stickler for getting the music right and for getting the concept right, and he won't compromise at all. Ego gets in the way when the creators become inflexible, when there's a problem with the show, and you see this happen a lot on flops, and the, uh, you know, the producer says, look at... You know, that song you wrote, Paul Simon, the second act, that's really not a very good song. It's not telling the story properly. The melody is lousy. It's really bringing the show down. You got to get rid of it. And the creator says, I love that song. That is a masterpiece, and it's not going to be touched. They collaborated, and but it got very difficult because Jerry would want to arbitrarily just cut the music wherever he felt like it, with no regard to the musicality of it. Needless to say, it was very tumultuous. The vibe right before opening night, when you're going through a change of directors, it starts to get, um, you know, you're worried. What's, what's happening? Is this all for the better? The Cape Man opened at the Marquee Theater on January 29th, 1998. The next morning, the reviews had some very mean things to say about Paul Simon and his musical. I was downright pissed off. I can't tell you, I had people in my family who was saying, you, get, you guys are getting screwed. I can clearly remember um, big Broadway's biggest flop, $11 million flop. I remember that headline of the New York Post. One review said it was like watching a slow dying animal to its death. <laughs> I mean, how much better can it get from there? <laughs> The Cape Man closed after 68 performances, and it lost its entire $11 million investment. We could build a whole new school auditorium for $11 million. I thought it was a beautiful new voice for Broadway, that uh, if people opened up their minds, it, it, would, it was a beautiful show. I've often wondered if when he made a few probably imprudent comments whether they started thinking, okay, let's see how we can get him. So kids, the K-Man proves that a huge pop music star won't always hit on Broadway. I wouldn't presume to go and direct a $100 million movie. Why would Paul Simon think that he could go and run a, um, a $10 million Broadway show? It was as if you'd said, okay, Paul Simon, here's a um, 747 to fly. You've never flown a plane before, but, you know, go ahead, take us to London. You know, he's going to crash it before it gets off the ground. A project like The Cape Man was possibly not suited for a Broadway environment that might have been more suited for, um, like, the New Wave Festival, where there isn't an expectation. The expectation is that there are no expectations, that it would be wide open and incredibly creative and mystical and magical, and that's what it was. If you're a pop or rock musician and you want to write a score to a Broadway show, you write the best score you can, and you find the best Broadway producer you can and the best Broadway book writer you can and the best Broadway publicist you can, and you let them run the show.
on paper, this sounded like an absolute winner. I mean, here you have the Dr. Seuss characters being put in a Broadway musical for the first time. The family audience for that is unlimited. We thought, well, what a great thing. Anyone could take a child to see this. And it was given this gigantic $11 million production, you know. They got out of town, they opened in Boston, they realized the costumes were ugly, the sets were ugly, the direction was bad, there was no story. Just because we got into some trouble, you know, aesthetically in, in Boston, I don't think that we ever thought that that would, we figured those are things that were fixable. It had a kind of a, a too cute, cute for its own good score. It was written by Lynn Aarons and Stephen Flaherty, who are a prominent Broadway composer lyricist team. But you could see in an early run through of the show, it was trying to tell too many stories. When Susical moved to New York in the fall of 2000, lots of people said lots of bad things about the play even before they'd seen it. There was a standoff between the producers and the writers. Unfortunately for the producers, the writers had an enormous amount of control over the show. So they could not push the writers in the direction that they may have had to go to make the show uh, as, as drama stronger than it was. One day we walked into a rehearsal and uh, Frank Galati, our beloved director, was not there. Oh, I was devastated when Frank was replaced. It was hard. It was definitely hard to, to handle, you know, because you just felt like you're not on solid ground. That's when I was pretty sure, oh, whoa, this is not in trouble. This is in trouble. Because quite frankly, in order to make a uh, musical work, really, uh, you have to have a singular vision. Susical opened on December 1st, 2001, with David Shiner narrating the show. The opening night had gotten pushed back several times, and I, my sort of one memory of it is, is, oh, thank God it's here. The crowd was just crazy. It was just fantastic, a magical night, because they got it, and they wanted to, and you could feel the positive vibe coming at you. I remember going to the opening night, and you can, if you have your ear to the ground, you can sort of tell what the reviews are gonna be. And as I walked in the opening night, the producer, Barry Weisler, was standing off to the side of the auditorium, and he grabbed me by the arm, and he pulled me into this sort of cloak room and pulled the curtains aside, and he looked at me and he said, they're gonna kill us, aren't they? And I said, yes, Barry, you're, you're right. They're gonna kill you. And he said, you know, we tried so hard to fix this show. I mean, we made massive, what they felt were massive changes. And we've really done our best. And uh, in the end, it's not gonna matter one bit. And of course, you know, the next morning we all stayed at a hotel and the next morning we get the reviews and we're all excited and I let them read them, you know, before and they were like, oh, well, it's, this one's good, and this one, you know, they were mediocre. There was never any, I felt, theatrical imagination at work in Susical. You never felt that you were entering this incredibly fantastical, imaginative world of Dr. Seuss uh, that you enter in the books. They never captured that on the stage. After a rocky start, Susical's producers temporarily replaced David Shiner with Rosie O'Donnell. Class, a big-name celebrity can sometimes help a Broadway play that's gotten a lot of bad press. I think the public was afraid to go because of the notices, but then when we put a celebrity in there, they'd go to see the celebrity. Audiences from when we started in Boston to when we finished here in New York were overwhelmed with joy. Leapt to their feet. We had a critic that whenever he could would mention Seussical in his articles, you know, in a in a negative vein, you know, there's trouble with David Shiner, there's trouble here, there's trouble here. Well, at least it's not Seussical. Seussical's final curtain on Broadway came on May 20th, 2001. The play lost more than $10 million. Now kids, there are some grown-up lessons to be learned from Seussical's flop. The first is that even someone as famous as Dr. Seuss can't guarantee success on Broadway. No matter how great you think a product is and how much you and people around you believe in it, uh, you can't quite control this extenuating circumstances. You've got to have one person who ultimately is in charge of that show. 
In the case of an Andrew Lloyd Webber show, it's going to be Andrew Lloyd Webber. In the case of the producers, it's going to be Mel Brooks. You really need one person, essentially a dictator, who can collaborate with everybody else, but at the end of the day, makes the big decisions about the show. In a lot of flops, that power has been diffused among too many people. And when those people are not working well together, everything's going to fall apart. Coming up in our final period of Flops 101, life after the flop. People in show business are nothing if not resilient, uh, particularly the creative people. And they can, they can take an idea and keep doing it until they get it right. Now, kids, here are some lessons about how we remember show business flops and the people who made them. Now, give me your complete attention. We tend to remember big failures as being worse than they actually were because we remember the story of the failure and the crash and burn. And we tend to get our memories um, of how good a show was mixed up with our memories of the media buzz. It's possible now, at this great remove, to go back and look at Waterworld, forget how much you don't like Kevin Costner, forget how much the movie cost to make, forget all the stories you heard about what a troubled production it was, and just watch the movie as an action movie. And you know what? It's not bad. It's not nearly as bad as you think it is. It's so much about the context in which they were made and the stories about them at the time that make them seem like flops. You know, the fact was, there have been many, many worse cop dramas than Cop Rock, which was ambitious and had some interesting storytelling and characters and, and took some, you know, notable chances. Yesterday's flops can be tomorrow's hits. You could look at a show, a Darren Star show like Central Park West, which was a complete fiasco, but at least some of the basic elements would turn up Years later, in Sex in the City, a huge hit by the same producer. Sex in the City and CPW were both, I think, in Darren's mind, an opportunity to tell stories about relationships, especially from the point of view of women, set against the backdrop of living in New York City. I think they both have the same DNA. It's kind of one of the great, you know, examples of the irony of success and failure. You know, out of failure comes success. Remember that, kids. That's very important. There's a fine line between a hit and a flop. Because the flop took a risk in some way. The studio was putting a huge amount of money behind a project, or a director was taking a risk, or a star was playing a role that audiences don't usually like to see him or her in. And so those are the same ingredients that go into making a hit, some sort of risk factor. It's just that with a the flop, they don't work. Titanic, which went wildly over budget and was delayed endlessly, had just as bad pre-opening publicity as Waterworld or Gigli or Cleopatra, but people liked the movie, so that publicity was forgotten, as were the bad reviews. We're talking about capturing a moment in time in the culture where you've managed to, what we used to say, catch the cultural wave. And that's just about timing. A single bit of miscasting, if there's one wrong note, if there's one or two big wrong notes in a script, if something has scenery that's a downer, can throw something completely out of whack. Nobody, as I said earlier, sets out to produce a bad show. Everyone who did these plots we've discussed believed that they were doing a really good show that I think they fundamentally believed in had artistic merit and commercial possibilities. They're not villains. They're not bad people. They're not stupid people. But you know what? It doesn't matter because those mistakes will be made again. Uh, and they'll be made with the best of intentions and they'll be made sometimes with hubris, but they'll be made because the excitement of the opportunity is so overwhelming that it doesn't matter what happened before. This time it's gonna be different. Okay, class, we've covered everything in Flops 101. Now study these lessons 
They're not just important in show business, they're good rules to follow for the rest of your life. 